we have a woman who is a very gifted woman, woman of the word. She is, let me tell you how we met, the way all y'all met me. Through that advertisement of me walking, my red hoodie on. Y'all filled out the survey. And then I called you. And this woman of God, she, her and I, we had a great conversation our first time. You know, sometimes you know when people got connects you to certain people. You really don't know how. And it was like this with this woman of God. And she was just sharing with me all the wonderful things that God is doing in her life. And what God has called her to and how. She is just really embedded in the community, really a devout advocate for justice, a kingdom woman, a preacher. We, we need to make sure y'all give her your phone number so she can put you on her text list because she sends out these pearls of wisdom. What is it, daily? Or Saturdays, okay. It's frequent. And she's just giving, dropping kingdom nuggets just act like you don't hear it when I preach it, okay? You know, we heard this. This Yolanda's. <laughs> Hallelujah. But this is a woman of God, and I love her heart, and, and she has been a supporter of our church. Um, she's been with us on Zoom dozens and dozens of times. She was here with us on our first day that we uh, we opened up, and she's been coming just about every every first Sunday of the month. And, um, you know, we heard Brooklyn Church, she told me. I said, I'll take that. She said, I'm from Brooklyn. So she said, I like it. I was like, that's all right. We'll take it. Hallelujah. And so this is not a guest per se, but she's a part of our family. And um, I'm really excited to hear from her. And I pray that you are expecting to hear from none other than, um, I'm going to call her, I just don't like the word reverend. But we're going to call her Pastor Yolanda Brown. She goes by many names. But uh, she's a great woman of God, and uh, we're going to hear from her. Come on, man. It's okay. Hallelujah. God bless you, and um, do your thing. Hallelujah. You, oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I, I'm, no, it's all good. I'm, I told you I'm bad at this. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But come on, let's give her God great big God bless you. Wait a minute. We got to do it this way. Come on, stretch your hands towards the, the podium. Hallelujah. Come on, say God bless you. Reverend Brown. Hallelujah. Go ahead, woman of God. Hallelujah. I was getting ready to go outside and just say goodnight because he was all in my, my word, God's word. But just like he said when I came early, um, he says, wow, we're flowing in the spirit. I didn't realize that we were really flowing in the spirit until he began speaking. But it gave me confirmation on what it was that God had given me. I wrestled with it. I wrestled with it because I wasn't sure. I don't take it lightly. I'm not very comfortable when I first pre present before a, a body of people. I don't know, I care how many times I do it. There's always this anxiety that I feel because I know to whom I'm serving. And I understand how important God's children are to him. And I know that oftentimes all we need is one word from God, and that would set things off. So I don't want to be in what I think should be said. I want to make sure that I'm flowing in the spirit. As Pastor said, again, all in my, all in my preparation, we met online, you know. And it's interesting how um, religious people, oftentimes we don't see no way for God to be in certain things. Humanity has made inventions upon inventions, and oftentimes the religious are the last one to get into it. And I understand being cautious because we know that there is an adversary. You know, so I'm not saying that we don't have any reason to feel that way, but oftentimes we begin to reject, we begin to villainize or demonize various things. And there were friends of mine, others that I know who understood the power of the medium. So one day, I'm just flowing through Facebook. You know, I'm looking. I usually go either to post or when I'm not doing anything, that mindless, you know, whatever, right. 
So, and I ran across this um, catch that caught my attention. What do you, what don't you like about church? Or what do you hate about church? I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> what do you hate about church? I said, well, I love church. So I'm going to answer this survey. Let me see. <laughs> Let me see what's there. So I answered the survey, and I also opened up to being contacted, you know. I said, no, that was a nice little way of catching someone's attention, you know, I thought. And, yes, we had a wonderful conversation. And there's something about knowing spirit. You may not know all the details, and sometimes you don't need to know, so mind your business, right? No. But anyway, you don't, you, know, you don't know all the details, but you know there's something there. And it may be years before you come to find out what it is. So that's how we met, and yes, and I, I came online, and um, I was egging him on because he's apologetic, you know. He's always concerned, and he should be, about how people receive and perceive him. But there are some times when I said, no, 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 come on, bring it, you know. And he would say, there's this lady in the chat that's, <laughs> that's egging me on because you know when God is calling for something. And sometimes I need someone to give me encouragement, and that encouragement helps me so I know as one who present the word, right, that I need this, so maybe he needed it also. You know? And I thank God so much for that. So um, thank you so much for your boldness. It takes a bold person, an audacious person, and a wise person to understand the many ways in which to connect with God's people. It's not about the numbers. It's not about the followers. All you need is one. Think about the woman by the well. There was one person from her city. That one person, an unlikely person, speaking of unlikely, and Pastor alluded to um, Pearls of Wisdom. And I hope you have your pen and you're taking, and taking notes now because once I start talking, I just start flowing, okay? You may not even hear what the scripture is, so know that God is in this, right? So we were talking, Pearls of Wisdom is, is a platform that I've been hosting now for seven years and it's on the sabbath day saturday morning from 8 to 8 30 a.m 30 minutes and the whole idea behind pearls of wisdom is to look for wisdom in the text how do we take this timeless ageless word of god how do we apply it to our lives now the bible says that wisdom is the principal thing and we should get it. But in all of our getting, we want to get an understanding. And we believe, at Pearls of Wisdom, that means the application. How do we take this timeless, ageless word of God, and how do we apply it to our lives now? Because the word of God is always relevant. We just got to find the application. So that's what we do on Saturday morning. And what we do at the end of the session, we always leave with a pearl. So this year's theme is expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. It sounds like an oxymoron, right? <laughs> How do you expect what you're not expecting, right? But basically what is required for us to be attentive and attuned. Attentive and attuned. Be alert because oftentimes the things that we may need and there's things that are coming to us that we don't even realize not about needs, about God blessing you. They may not come in the packages in which you were expecting them. They may not be coming from the north. They may not be coming from the south. They may not be coming six foot tall. They may not be coming five feet. You never know who God is going to use. So we have to expect the unexpected. So that means that we're walking circumspect. Always anticipating, right? Is this the day? <laughs> you know, you may be walking down the street and you're looking for a home and you're not sure where you want to live. You're just asking, Lord, order my steps. And you know something is in the air. Something is even around. You almost can feel it, but you can't see it. And you're not sure if that's the day or not. Expect the unexpected. And one of the things, the overarching pearl for us was that we have to be able to adjust. Because expecting the unexpected means there's going to be a change in your vision. There may be a change in appearance. There may be a change in your outlook. And when those changes happen, we have to be willing to adjust. We may have to adapt. We may have to reconcile some things. And all of this came from my favorite character in the book, which is Jacob. <laughs> 
I think Jacob get a bum to rap, you know. I really do. It's just like Dowling Thomas. All the other ones were Dowling, too. They didn't believe, right? But everyone says Dowling Thomas, right? But anyway, so Jacob, here it is. He served this man for many, many years. He served for one wife. <laughs> he got hooked, winged, and bamboozled. Then he had to serve for another. And so now he's saying it's time to go. There's time and situations in our lives when it's time to go. It's time to move on. And so we want to do the right thing, and he wanted to do the right thing, so he communicated to Laban, his, his uncle, you know, his master at that time because he was working for him. But Laban realized that he was blessed because of Jacob. And you know how it is. No one want to let a good thing go. If you got your A team, you don't want your star player off your team. No matter how much you're supporting that player, you know that your wins has a lot to do with them being there, right? So he didn't want him to go. And he began trying to uh, coerce him. And Jacob said, he's seeing now this is an impasse. So let me adjust. Change, right? He wasn't expecting it, but let me adjust. Let me adjust and adapt the situation to what it is that I want to do or what it is I need to do. So he served for him even longer. You have to read the story. And reading the story, so at the end of it, going through all of this, and also, again, being hoodwink and bamboozled, because Laban was all about the shift and the switch. He would bait you and switch on you, right? And so anyway, at the end of it, because Jacob was able to adapt and to adjust and to reconcile some things, he left there in a better position than he would have when he was ready to leave, and he was already flourishing. So we are called to expect the unexpected. You know, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher of the word. Now, there's sometimes I may get excited. You may be calling that preaching. I don't know. But sometimes it's in the subtle things. Because I want to sow seeds. Because I know what I receive. It takes a seed to be sown in my spirit. All we need is one word from God to change our situation around. Right? So we thank God so much for that. So, yes, pearls of wisdom, words to live by, book, chapter, and verse. is a Saturday morning from 8 to 8.30. And then Wednesday today is daybreak. Again, another, another program that's based upon the Jacob narrative because he wrestled, okay? Jacob on the road of reconciliation. He's going back. He's leaving now, Laban, and now he has to reconcile with his brother. We know the story, you know, but God got plans, so we can't always say who was the preferred one. I believe that God put it out there to see who was going to rise to the occasion, who was going to honor the blessing, who was going to fight for, who wouldn't have sold it. And I think that's why Jacob got it. But that's Yolanda's commentary, right? So anyway, so here he is. He's, he's a little fearful, probably very much fearful, right? Fearful, and he sent everybody away. And that night he camped. And at that night, the angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob. It wasn't Jacob's initiative. He didn't start wrestling with, 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 with the angel. The angel wrestled with him. And in life, when we're on the road of reconciliation, life is nothing but reconciliation. We are reconciling to people. We're reconciling to things. We're reconciling unto God. We're reconciling unto ourselves. So life in all of its avenues is a road of reconciliation. And at times, there are things that begin to wrestle with us. They can come in form of finances. They can come in form of headaches, physical abnormalities, or it may even be the co a pandemic, COVID-19, whatever it is. And we begin to wrestle. But God has given us the blessing. And if you wrestle, you don't give up. You don't give in. You don't give over. You don't let go. And because Jacob prevailed, what did the angel ask him? What do you want from me? And the word said that he commanded the blessing. He didn't demand it. He didn't have to demand it. It was already his. He had proven that before. He commanded the blessing. So daybreak, at the break of day, because he didn't give up, he didn't give in, he received the blessing. So daybreak, Wednesday morning at 6 a.m., 30 minutes, is all about the blessing. Today, Word was, you are blessed.
because of your faith. So again, pastor was right all in my text. <laughs> but anyway, I want to make sure I be true to the time. So that's a little background on um, some of the things that I get to do. And yes, I am an advocate for justice. Um, I believe in speaking truth to power. Um, every kingdom was always informed, if especially they were listening to God, by men and women of God. The kings were informed by the prophets and the priests that had enough gumption, you know. And so I understand that those of us who understand the word of God and the principles of God, not just the word, but the principles and the spirit. Because sometimes we get the word and we don't have no idea what the spirit is saying. But when we know that, that's where we get to share in other places. But we got to be in those places. We can't just hide in the four walls. We have to realize those places that God has placed us to serve. Our jobs, our businesses, or wherever. Those are places, those are point of references for us to mingle and integrate with people. Jesus said to his disciples, occupy until I come. Occupy. That's a military term. Occupy. You know? Occupy. I remember maybe six years ago, uh, there was a big old demonstration where uh, some of us occupied Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was my only experience of understanding Occupy, but Occupy until I come. And I believe, this is Yolanda again, I'm just getting, getting, letting you get to know who I am and some of the things that I, I think. I believe that because we have an Occupy to the point that we should, I believe that we could be the cause why Jesus' return might be delayed at the portion for which people most are expecting. Now, we know that Christ is in us, but on a global level, could it be because we're not in those places? Could it be that because the industry in most places belong to the enemy? Could it be because we've abdicated our responsibility to be salt and light? We're so enlightened in the church, but when we walk out the door, what are we? Weeds? I don't think so. So I believe that because we're not occupying, and it's not because we're not, because we see now there are more men and women of professed faith who are occupying various positions of authority, of influence. So we understand that it's the blessing that carry forth. So anyway, so we just got finished through our Holy Week. Holy Week, Holy Week. Holy Week is so awesome. I like pageantry and uh, ceremonies and all those things that lead up to the holidays, you know, because what it does, it gives me an opportunity to learn more about the faith and the tradition of, 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 of the faith and things that were adopted as a way to enforce, reinforce our journey and our relationship. So we know that Holy Week, which was last week, it began back in February, right? The journey from um, the Lenten season, from Ash Wednesday on to um, Resurrection Sunday. And one of the things that we have to realize is that in that process and in that journey, we can see that Every step was intentional. And I believe that's why for those who observe Lenten season or Advent when it comes time for Christmas or the journey of Pentecost or whatever, I believe it's done so that we can relive or recall the steps to our faith. So God was intentional about every one of those steps as God is intentional about every one of our steps. I thank God again for this house because uh, you have to be mindful of where you speak and what you speak where you speak so that you're always in a place of respect. But I know that I'm in a house of liberty. So put your hands together for your pastor. There's nothing like having a shepherd who walks under the covering of God. One who's bold, one who's audacious, and one who's wise. One who's given to prayer, one who's given to praise, and understand that the two go hand in hand. I always say that praise is a prayer turned inside out. 
You got a sock, right? Whether it's on the wrong side or the right side, inside out, it is still a sock. It's a communication way we way in which we communicate with God. So the holidays, like the resurrection, you know, some began forty six days before. And that was the onset of the Lenten season, uh, you know, beginning to journey to retrace the steps to the crucifixion. Some want to jump over, but you can't jump over anything. It's like missing an ingredient out of a, a, of a sure recipe. You have to go through each process. If you don't sift that flour, your cake may not come out the way you want it to come out. Every step is a step that's intentional. So the journey in the Lenten season is retracing the steps of the cru- to the crucifixion because we're collecting and we're recalling, remembering the sacrifice of Christ. And when I'm reminded of the sacrifice, the actual sacrifice, I mean the events, the things that occur, my heart is even the more tender for the Lord. Because there are times life happens, and we can go on, yes, we love the Lord, what have you, but we're not remembering those things, and not that we have to remember those things every day, but if we're not revisiting those, those things, we may forget our why. And one of the things in life is we don't want to forget our why, because our why is usually what motivates us. Why do we love this Jesus? Because of the sacrifice, right? He said, there's no greater love the one who's willing to lay down their life for another. Oftentimes you hear, and it has its place, but sometimes I think it's a little too much. My opinion, this is Yolanda speaking, right? We hear how much we don't deserve the mercies of God. How much we don't deserve this. No, we may not deserve it, but God saw that we were worth it. We were worth it. So we're reliving the unfailing love of Christ, understanding there's no greater love. We can find ourselves at the beginning, the last leg of the Lenten season at Holy Week. Now, Holy Week is the final week of the Lenten season. From Ash Wednesday to Palm Sunday, from Morty Thursday to Good Friday, we are reminded of God's love and that we are worth God's love. Every step is intentional, as I said. Morty to Thursday was humbling ourselves to one another to wash another's feet as Christ washed his disciples' feet. And then Good Friday is the seven last words. And I love the seven last words. This is one year where I have not participated as a presenter of one of the words, but I was in the midst where others delivered a powerful word. And and the seven last words, these are things that we can take with us, right? The word of forgiveness, reminding us how important it is to forgive. Remember when Jesus forgave, they said, well, who is this that can forgive? They still didn't realize who Jesus was. He said, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It's not just a prophecy of him. It's the declaration. It's the word that he spoke. But anyway. And then the other word is a word of promise. This day, just by acknowledging who Jesus Christ was, this criminal, this convicted person was getting into paradise. Just through the acknowledgement, there's power in the acknowledgement. So don't write somebody off because they're not doing it the way that you think they should be doing it. Because in their heart, if they have acknowledged, just the acknowledgement. Now, granted, he didn't have any more opportunity to do anything else wrong, but it was the acknowledgement. He said, this day, you will be with me in paradise. And then the next word was a word of responsibility, making sure provisions were where they needed to be, making sure that his mother was provided for. Couldn't go any further until that was done. Sometimes we may want to forget things and we'll go on with things that take care of itself. No, there's some things that require you or I to make sure that things are in place. So from the cross, from this position, of a weighty experience. Can you imagine? I can't, but I do have an active imagination. How could I even have enough energy to say anything? 
but yet and still. And the next one was a declaration. He was declaring that he was thirsty. I thirst because I'm feeling this separation with God, and I know there is no separation. I thirst for the presence of God. And then there was a pronouncement. And, 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 and even before the pronouncing, the declaration, he also de declared, you know, uh, why have thou forsaken me? I'm quite sure Jesus comes in the volume of the book. So he knew the narrative with Abraham, how Abraham was to sacrifice his son, and Abraham didn't have to go through with it. So he may have been, this is Yolanda speaking, right? Well, okay, I'm going to go through this, but I'm not going to really have to go all the way. So he's saying, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Isaac got off. <laughs> This is Yolanda. Okay, so anyway, so then he, 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 he has a pronouncement. He has to pronounce that it was finished. What it was that he came to do was finished. But how many know that just because something is finished doesn't mean it's complete? I like to cook, so I use these analogies. So let's say you season and roast stuff and you put it in the oven and you begin to roast it at its appropriate temperature, and you take it out at the designated time. Now, you've finished it, right? Right? But it's not complete until it rests. Because if you were to go into it before it has rested, you would destroy all of the work that you've done. You would lose all of its essence. But if you let it sit and rest, there's power in the rest. There's provision in the rest. And when it's rested, then you have completed the thing. So he said, I have, I, I, it's finished. And then the rest was the committal. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. So we thank God for all the things that we learn year upon year about this holy week. And holy Saturday being the Saturday way the body of Christ laid at rest. I like to call that the day out of time. <laughs> the day out of time nowhere to go nothing to do the day out of time in eternity still but out of time right and then this Sunday the resurrection he's risen so now what now what how do we continue to journey along with God on the road of reconciliation in the post-resurrection experience. When Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 38, and um, I think I have enough room to go there here, okay? And, um, but if you have your, your, your Bibles or your phones, I still like the pages. I, 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 you know, I'm just very intimate with my pages. I can't get intimate with the, um, with the, with the smartphone, but, um, Okay, so Hebrews, I marked it off, so why is it not? Hebrews 10 and 38, and we're just going to look at that one little piece of scripture, and we're going to jump around a little bit because I want us to be able to connect the dots. Now, Hebrews 38, it says, now the just, mm -hmm. you say, and now what, right? And now what? Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, that means that he doesn't have the faith. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. So when your pastor was flowing up here, I said, okay, I don't need to get up there. He's already preached the message. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so it is by faith that we are able to excel in the post-resurrection experience. It is faith in the kingdom of God. A whole nother paradigm. A whole nother purview. Jesus taught much on the kingdom. And while we learn a lot as our code of conduct and our responsibility from the words that were administered from the cross, but when you go back over, you look what Jesus taught. Oftentimes you hear the saying, what did Jesus, what would Jesus do? And so some things we know and other things we just try to figure it out. But what did Jesus teach? Jesus taught much on the kingdom of God. 
And sometimes you have to teach before you can make a change. Any pastor in their right calling, doing the right things that they're supposed to do, and loving the people, understand you just don't go in and start changing things without first teaching on it. Especially if the people are not used to this. Now, starting with John the Baptist, his announcement in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, the kingdom of God is at hand. So it was like setting it up. It was like setting up for, the, for the, like a layup shot, right? <laughs> he said, starting, starting, starting at that point, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Here is coming one who's going to come and give you the understanding of the kingdom. And then Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33, seek ye first. The, the, the premier thing the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That the kingdom of God, the kingdom speaks to the structure and his righteousness speaks to the systems. So we have to understand systems and structures in there. So we talk about what do we do and now what? After coming through Holy Week, after going through retracing the steps, after falling in love with Jesus all over again, how do we continue to live in this post-resurrection experience? So why do you think Jesus said all that? Let's go to Revelation. Chapter 11, verse 15. Re Revelation, chapter 11, verse 15. I want us to connect the dots. And I'm glad when I got out the cab, it said Bible study. So I said, okay, we're going to study the word today. You know, um, and it says, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Remember, God knows the ending from the beginning. So Jesus come to make sure we understand what it is we're getting ready to get into and why it was necessary because that's why we need to occupy so that the industries, the kingdoms, and what have you can become the kingdoms of our Lord. And notice it was the seventh angel that declared that. And the reason why I say that is because um, there's a lot that's significant about the number seven. We have the seventh angel, the seventh day, the seventh month, <laughs> the seventh year, and on and on and on. And each one of those carry a greater significance. If you go back, you look through Revelation, and you look at the various things that happen leading up to the seventh angel, each one has their responsibility. But God is one a God of exponential increase. From faith to faith to glory to glory. And given that it carries a greater significance, that means that we get to be attentive and attuned to it. Because we're now being ready to expect the unexpected. We don't know how this is going to work out. We have an idea from the illustration that's given to us. Remember, God knows the ending from the beginning. And then in Mark chapter 14, verse 25, at Jesus' last supper, I know we call it the last supper, but that was his last supper. I'm still eating, you can tell, right? I still eat. <laughs> it was Jesus' last supper. He says, verily I say unto you, I will drink no more the fruit of the vine until, 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 until that day I drink it in new in the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdoms of our God. Now Jesus forever had his eyes on the kingdom. 
And the kingdom of God is referenced 359 times in the canonized Bible that we have. And I say that specifically because there are books that didn't make it in. And now people have their own say as to why and so on and so forth. But can, can you imagine what kind of book you'd be carrying around? <laughs> you could have carried it around, right? I mean, it'd be bigger than no, Grandma's Bible. Remember Grandma's Bible? The really big one that you, you, you leave it in the house, you know, because it was so large, right? So anyway, so 359 times. Now, Luke and Mark of the Synoptics Gospels, they refer to it the most in their writings. So that's why it's often time to read the Bible. Let's not come too familiar with the word of God that we can't continue to receive from the word of God. We have our favorite stories. We have our favorite narrative. Speaking of which, this year, you know, oftentimes beginning of year, there are goals of reading the Bible through the year. So I said, well, you know what, um, um, there's so much going on, and I want to be able to stick to it. I'm, I, I'd rather do something short and diligent. So I said, well, I want to do it in six months. So I Google my unpaid assistant. She's faithful, too. You know, she, she works good. You know? So I Google, I asked my Google assistant, assistant, you know, show me something. And I found a, a pro, an outline on reading the Bible in six months. And I've been sticking to it. And the reason why I say that is because now I want to read it from front to back. I've done that before, but for the most part, I'm wherever God leads me or whatever the word that God gives me, I want it to be informed by scripture. This has been my approach. I may read one book here, one, one book there. But it's also good to know because then when we do that, we'll be able to see what it was that Jesus was teaching. And we don't want to be only New Testament only believers. And there's a lot who are not, but there's still a fraction. And one time in history, there were only New Testament only believers. And truth be told, they may have only received the New Testament. Okay. But in reading the Old Testament, the First Testament, and the Second Testament, you will see all of what Jesus referred to. And then when you begin to hear, hear his voice within the text of the first testament, you can hear what he said in the second testament, and you have a better understanding of when he said, yeah, I, Behold, I come in the volume of the book. Everybody spoke about me. And oftentimes that's thought about just the prophetic, the prophecy. I, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, with his eyes always on the kingdom and on us, because it's about bringing us into the kingdom, right? Every kingdom has at least three things or four things, but there's other things too, right? And that is a king, a people in a territory, and currency. Now, uh, 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 Bishop Tudor Bismarck, he has a book that speaks more about the things that's needed for the kingdom, but I'm just looking at the simplicity of things here, right? Okay, a king, people in a territory, and a currency. Now, the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, what do you think the currency is? Faith is the currency. And again, as you heard your, your pastor on the floor up here, I said, you know what? <laughs> I don't know why he invited me here because he's giving everything. <laughs> but that lets us know it's the same spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm in good company. You're in good company, right? He said, for the kingdom of God spans many planes, the spiritual and the natural. Now, keep it in mind that God is a spirit. And so we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And faith is the currency of that kingdom. So if we want to feel well in the kingdom of God, we have to have our faith. Yeah. Imagine going out and you don't have a dollar in your pocket. You can't get in a cab. You can't even get on a bus. I mean, you might be able to beg the bus driver you know, or walk in like you don't see it, right? But you need to have currency in order to navigate. Currency is an exchange. And your faith is an exchange for the things that are not seen and the evidence of the things that you want to have. So, 
we can see that we got this currency. Faith is the true currency of the kingdom. And that's the only way we can truly follow God and walk as kings and queens. Because we have our faith. Think about the armor of God above all else. Above the, above the sword, above the shoes, above the breastplate, above the girdle, above all else. Your shield of faith. So it has preeminence. Why? Because it is the currency of the kingdom of God. Now, unlike some of the altcoins in the cryptocurrency world, faith's intrinsic values increases exponentially. And it's not influenced by man. It is influenced by the one who holds it. It says, show me your faith, show me your works. So we are the one who add the intrinsic value to our faith. We're given a measure of it. But what we do with it, it's just like the parable of the talent. If you have faith to work, faith to work it, it increases. So we don't want to hide our faith. Come out, come out from wherever you are. God has called some people forth. And then on top of that, it is done, it increases in value to the glory of God because faith is of God. And the only way to please God is having faith. There's no other way. There's other ways you can be in good graces with God. But to truly please me that God is moving those areas requires us to have faith. It is its value, faith value is witnessed to those who work it, who invest it, who produce, yielding a greater return. So let's look at a last portion of scripture. And we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm going to read just a portion. We're going to read from verse 1 through 6. Hallelujah. How am I doing on time? Okay. I'm going to hurry up. <laughs> My ride will be here in a little bit. Okay. All right. It says faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. We talk about the currency, right, of the kingdom. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift, this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> and by it being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found, because God had translated him before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we ought to commit continuously, beloved, to building up your faith. Keeping in mind that faith without works is dead. So work it. Exercise your faith, applying a corresponding action to it, that it yields a greater return. Occupy until the kingdoms of God, all of, of this world, becomes the kingdom of our God. So what are we to do? We ought to follow God so that we can live as kings. For in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1, and this is my closing scripture. And I'm not going to take the preacher's liberty and, and have four more clothes. <laughs> and it says, okay, Isaiah uh, 32, for we shall, uh, we, so we follow God so that we live with kings. In Isaiah 32, verse 1, it says, behold, a king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in um, judgment. So, we have 
So we have this wrap up here for us so that we can leave with the necessary arsenal because we have a testimony that has witnessed to the use of our faith. Now faith is the currency of the kingdom. So in order for us to excel, we have to shift our mindset. Because as we're in a season of miracles, as Pastor had said, where we're expecting the unexpected, that means there's going to be an unsuspecting move of God. And that means there's a miracle beyond the normal miracles. The miracle of waking up every day. The miracle of putting your feet on the floor and you're not falling through. The miracle of being able to see. The, bir- the miracles that are untold. But we're talking about unsuspecting move of God. But we have to be willing to adapt. Don't change our focus. Keep our focus on the kingdom. But we got to be willing to be flexible. And I think that's what happened to... Um, Judas. Judas was a zealot, meaning he was an advocate. He was an advocate. He probably was pounding the pavement, you know, waiting for God to come because he believed the scriptures. And he was disappointed because Jesus didn't come the way that he thought he was going to come. So he began questioning him. Like, okay, I don't know what this guy is all about, you know. Um, know, I don't think, I I believe, but now nothing's changing. So we have to be ever poised, attuned, and attentive so that we can adjust and adapt to receive the miracle of God. It may not come the way we think it's going to come. Hello? So be ever ready. And so how do you be ready for something that you don't know? Just be ready. Walk circumspect. Just ready for a tap on the shoulder. I'm opening a mailbox and there's an envelope. Those things do happen, you know. Okay. I remember one year, and this is this is not a scripture, but this is my clothes. I remember one year is when I first entered into my sin experience when God called me out of corporate America, right? And I was, you know, zealous enough to say, okay, God said it. I shut everything down, right? And I'm walking through the sand and things were rough. And I wasn't used to having it like that. You know, and if we did as a kid, my parents didn't let us know that. And I wanted, we were having a revival, and I needed some stockings. And I was, I had no money. And I said, Lord, I need some stockings. I, you know, I don't want to go bare-legged or whatever the case may be. You know, I need some stockings. And I went to my post office box that day just to get my mail, my bills and whatever. And there were a pack, a three-pack of Hanes. Hanes. Now, Hanes is not the one you buy from the bodega. <laughs> you know, and, and I said, and no one could believe me. I didn't order it. I don't know how it happened, but we're talking about expecting. Expect the unexpected. So, yes, like your pastor said, it's our faith. But you show me your faith, I want to see your works. And then I'll then determine how much you really trust God. And I'm speaking to me, this word, I'm the first partaker of this word. So don't think this is a your word, this is a we word. Okay, Yolanda, I need to work it, <laughs> practice what you preach, right? <laughs> but listen, Father God, we thank you so much for this word. I 